We would all like to believe that nothing could hinder us from the goodness. That once we're saved, we're always saved. And just like a father has a son, he cannot neglect his very own. But just like in the sense of being a father and a son, we can anger a father to a point where he doesn't love us any longer. So are we still going to inherit the same blessing in which he had once in store to the son in which he loved? Now, how much more once we're given a Holy Spirit, a spirit that is supposed to guide us into the way of righteousness? But we, being humans, we choose when to activate it and when to disable it. A little leaven can leaven the whole lump. So what comes after grieving? Isn't there hate? Stay tuned for this message entitled, Grieving the Holy Spirit. Bringing your calling to life. This is coming from Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 3. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So I want to stop there just to talk about this. This is Paul speaking, and he doesn't want you to feel different from him. Although he's an apostle, although he's made his calling and his election sure, he wants you to realize that he is a prisoner of the Lord, which when you think about it, a prisoner is someone who cannot do what he wants. So they have to go to sleep a certain time. They have to go outside a certain time to exercise. Maybe they got to eat a certain time. So in the same sense, being a prisoner of the Lord, we cannot do as we feel we have need to do. Like we cannot just open up our mouths and say whatever comes into our minds. But we have to think, being prisoners of the Lord, that he has ordained us and we that he has bought us with a price. And we are no longer our own, which is a good thing. Which means that we're not walking to and fro in this world, seeking love and never able to come to the fullness of the truth. So, we can't say this without saying that you have to walk worthy of your calling. And so, Paul is clearly saying that you have to step up your game. It's not enough for you to say that you are a Christian, yet you keep falling and falling into the same sins over and over again. He says, if you are righteous, they who are righteous has to do righteousness. It's simple. Yet we make it difficult because we look to the future and say, well, when am I going to mess up? But with God, he makes the impossible possible. That you could believe in something greater than yourself and that you could hold on to a promise that just keeps on giving. And two, it says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. You see that there's many people who want to come to the fullness of God. They have made their calling and they may not have made their election sure as of yet. But they slip and they fall. They make mistakes. Whether it's your son, your daughter, maybe it's your wife, your husband, whosoever it be. It may be even a friend or a worker, a co-worker. Nevertheless, if you are in the lowliness and meekness, which means that you're just humble in the way and you are long suffering in the sense that you're always forgiving them for what they may have done to you, couldn't that make them stronger? Now, I know you may see yourself as one person and they may have sinned against the whole world, but just seeing that one has forgiven them, their minds could be open to the possibility that God could forgive them, and if God forgives them, then maybe everyone else could forgive them too. So now you can start to realize your power of forgiveness. And that you could bring your calling to life simply by forgiving one who's making a same calling. In three, it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So there is a call to action here. It's basically saying that you have to work in order to have this unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It's not something that just comes on you and stays with you because there's the devil, your adversary, that was seeking who he could devour. 
So as long as you know that, then you have to work to keep the peace, whether it's in your household, um, whether it's in your house, whether it's in yourself, you know, whether it's in your workplaces, wheresoever you go, you have to work in order to keep the bond of peace. If this bond is broken, then there's no telling what could come in. And in the same sense that you may have brought your calling to life, you could also bring it to death. Because you lean to your own understanding and you start saying that this way is too hard and it's beginning to feel impossible for you to come to the fullness of the truth and that you can maintain yourself in the fullness of the truth. But don't forget, you have to be worthy. And by being worthy, you have to be faithful. Faithful to what? Faithful to calling. The calling to life. And life more abundantly. Don't let anyone deceive you. You can do it. As long as you keep putting one foot in front of the other and moving forward to your calling and your election sure. No one is perfect. This is coming from Ephesians 4, verse 4 through 6. It says there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all and in you all. So again, we all have heard this. No one is perfect. And God has opened up my knowledge to this one thing. That if you are in the embodiment of Christ. And you have been granted the Holy Spirit. And that you are called unto a lively hope. As the one that Christ has been given. Then why wouldn't we be considered perfect? You see, the one thing that hinders us from believing that we could be perfect is the mind. The mind will want to believe what it wants to believe. Consider it this way. If you think that you'll never be perfect, then the mind is never going to want to be perfect. Which is why we struggle to come to His perfection. If we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism... And Christ was baptized and we're all baptized in the same sense, in the same way, to acknowledge the Father as well as the Son through the Holy Ghost power. And we've all been given this one faith unto a lively hope. And we have one Savior granted unto us as an advocate for all of our sins as well as our iniquities. Then what should hinder us from this love? The love that God says, I will not only purge you of your old sins and the old man but I will cleanse you and bring you to perfection it says even furthermore that there is one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all so what he's saying here is if God is this all powerful being all knowing full with wisdom, knowledge and understanding why would he leave you imperfect now, don't get it fooled with the sense of the flesh. The flesh is imperfect. But your spirit is perfect. Why? Because the spirit is given to you by God. And if the spirit is ruling your life, which means that you're feeding it with the true fruits of life, as reading your word, praying unto him, fasting, and just doing what is right as God sees it fit, then why wouldn't it come or bring you to the fullness? It says the word will clean you up. Does the word only clean up part of you? When it, it clean up all of you? When does it stop cleaning you? You see, this is why you have to question the very things that the world brings unto us. Even questioning your very thoughts. No one is perfect. Then what's the reason? Why are we here? Why do we read the Bible? Why do we go to church? Are you starting to see why? This is not the truth. Even Christ says in Matthew 5 in the end, He says, Be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Because without first establishing your calling and making your election sure, there is no purpose, there is no meaning to life. And if there is no meaning to life, then you're dead. Yet, you live. So don't think about 
the fact of your mistakes, but understand that although none is perfect by the world's standard, you could become perfect by God's standard. The importance of your calling. So this is coming from Ephesians 4, verse 7 through 8, and then 11 through 12. It says in 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So, just talking about this, we have to, we've talked about this in other slides and other messages that I have delivered unto you. And basically what he's saying is, as you have made your calling in your election sure, there's a gift that comes to you. And we're going to read more about this in 8. It says, Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, you have to understand that Christ gave these gifts. And through Christ comes life, and it comes more abundantly. Now, if he has given you a gift, and he says that you could become a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people to show forth the praises that is due unto his matchless name, then you have to understand that this also has to come with a shield. And by a shield, I basically mean that you have to work yourself up to become this calling, which means you have to make your election sure. So you're going to make some mistakes. Now this is not leeway into having mistakes the rest of your life. Eventually you're going to be strong over the mistakes you once made a year ago or even yesterday. So it says in another word in the New Testament that as you sin you have an advocate. So again the grace, there's a common grace that is given to everyone in the world where they could come to God and could serve God. And then there's another grace that's given to those who may be a pastor or maybe those who are um, teachers or maybe those who are evangelists. And we're going to read about this later on, actually. We're going to read about this in 11. It says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting or the, of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay, so this is where the importance of your calling matters because how in the world could you teach anyone to be perfect when you're not perfect yourself? How could you teach anyone to become perfect when there's no such thing as perfection? So you're teaching, what you're going to have to do eventually is you're going to have to teach them that you're going to fall eventually. Yeah, so... If you're going to fall eventually, why would I even just start? Why, why would I even walk? Why don't I just stay in the sins that I'm in? I don't want to fall. That's scary. Just waiting for me to fall. So what you're telling me is just hope that you're going to fall. Is there anything lively in that message? No. Because it's not part of God's message. He died for you, not the you that you are now, but the you that you could become. The fact that you could look at your enemy and love him the same way that you love yourself. This is power. And this is the importance of your calling that you're not just here to save yourself, but you're here to save another. Whether it's your wife, your spouse, or your children, or your co-workers, just understand that there's a light given unto you that you could save those who see the light. Don't think that everyone is going to see the light, though. Don't think that this light is for everyone. Understand that those people who come unto you, maybe it's your enemy who keep trying to provoke you. Maybe it's the light is for them. Because when they see that you don't fight or use the same words that they're using, their minds and their eyes will be open to the fullness of the truth of Christ and understand that greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. So understand your importance of life, and then you'll soon understand the importance of your calling.
When do we stop? This is coming from Ephesians 4 verse 13 through 15. It says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So I want to stop there. Just because we may be married or we may have children or we may have a lot of people which we love on our day-to-day -day basis and we are working and giving them the Word of God, but they're just not getting it. And so you feel within yourself that, okay, I should stop then. Maybe these people are not supposed to get it. Maybe they're unworthy. But you have to remember that God created man in his likeness, which is why we cannot hate our enemies, nor could we hurt them. But we must keep giving them the light as they keep coming to us. And the reason why I have to say coming to us is because sometimes the very people in which we love, they come to us with anger and wrath and envy and all sorts of evils. And they come with one mind frame. They come with one purpose. And the purpose is to hurt us. But you have to turn around as children of the light. And understand that any form of darkness that comes to the light becomes destroyed. Because the light is greater than darkness. So just keep moving in the direction of righteousness. And understand that eventually these people will come to the knowledge of the Son of God and realize that the same way that you are perfect, they could become perfect. And understand that in the first verse, it says unto a perfect man, which is kind of like another being. We understand that there are celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but there's also one that is mentioned here. As unto a perfect man, which means that there is an embodiment that will come unto the people of this world, the people of God. This is not when you're dead, this is while you're on earth and living, that you could have this body as of a perfect man, woman or child. As long as you take the engraftment of Christ, as it says, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So as you are in this world, just like he says that you're going to be given an incorruptible body when you see God, when you die and you're risen or whether you're raptured or caught in up or taken up, you have to realize that while you're in this world, he has also given you a body that you can endure the grease and the chastisement of men. And it's found in the perfect man. Or the body of the perfect man. In 14 it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive you. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. So you have to understand that there's going to be people who want to deceive you. Okay, by cunning craftiness, because you have to understand that there's people who cannot become perfect and why they cannot become perfect is because they don't want to come to the fullness of Christ. They want to have some part of the world and they want to have some part of Christ. And that's a lukewarm person. And we understand in Revelation that a lukewarm person will be spewed out. So when you understand that, then you also understand that you can no longer be children. You have to grow up. You can't say, well, we're just human. You can't just say, well, this is me and this is who I am. No, that's a child. A child will say that I'm a child and I know no better. But as Paul says, I was once a child. But now, as I've come to the fullness of God, I put away those childish things. For he says, I used to think as a child, I used to feel as a child, and I used to do as a child, but now I'm a man. And I put away those childish things. So when are you going to put away those childish things? When are you going to stop being a child and come to the fullness? When are you going to stop being moved around with every person who gets you angry and you just react to everything? When are you going to start being, becoming the foundation in which God has wanted you and instilled in you to be? 
The point to this message is you don't stop until you see the Father. And even then, you're not going to stop. But everything is going to be complete. So don't listen to those people who want to dumb down your faith, dumb down who you can become as being that perfect man, woman, or child. You have to come to the fullness. And don't let anyone stop you from becoming who God has ordained you to be. Let your heart discover God. So in Ephesians 4, verse 17 through 19, it says, If this I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto this viciousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. So it is greedy. It is greedy for you to have tasted of the goodness and then tell God, I don't want anything to do with you. Rather, you want to walk in the same sins that God has already delivered you from. And there's an ignorance there because you don't understand that once a person is delivered, they're delivered. Now, I know what you're thinking about. Once saved, always saved. And there's some truth to that in the sense that if you keep walking in his perfectness or perfectness, then you're going to keep being saved because you're in the light. And if you remain in the light, there's no darkness, there's no root of bitterness that will come up and choke the very blessings in which God has given you and take away the very fruit in which God has already ordained in you. So you see that if you become Christ or children of God, then you're children of God. You don't, there's no one that could take you from that. The only one that could hinder you from this goodness is yourself, which is why Paul says that I testify. Because this is something that although he knew the law very well, you know, a Pharisee above Pharisees, you know, way above his time, even his very age, you know, he walked and did the will of man and he was alienated from the truth of God. He wants you to understand that although you may testify that God is who he says he is and Christ is your savior and, redeem, and your redeemer and he lives. If you do not profess it by walking in it, it's nothing. He says your understanding will be darkened and you will be alienated from the true life in which you were supposed to have. Which is the life of peace, of love. Of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. He says even to a point where you pass your feelings. And now you have given yourself up to all sorts of uncleanness. There's no telling what can happen. It says a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. When you see someone given to a point where they're defying the very nature of men and women and children. In order to do what the heart wants to do this is not about the heart this is about sin when you believe that sin is you know the very works that God has instilled within us and there's nothing that we could do in order to stop it this is a disease that would keep eating away at you and would eat up anyone in which you touch as long as you bear this disease even Naaman the Syrian, he knew that he has to be clean, cleansed of this impurity in which he had. We all have impurities. But if you remain in these impurities, then you're going to be diseased. And if you're diseased and you become alienated from the children of God, and you become alienated from the truth which is in God, which is why many of us feel weak. But God turns back and says it's never too late. Let the weak now say that they are strong. Give up this uncleanness. Give up this viciousness. Give up this greediness. Give up the past feelings. 
of all idolatry and hatred and variance and wrath and give your heart to understanding and know that God is still able to do exceedingly and abundantly and above all that you could ever ask or think according to the power that works within you. Just believe it, that you could receive it and have life and have it more abundantly. Prove it. This is Ephesians 4 verse 20 through 23. It says, but ye have not so learned Christ. Who do you think Paul is speaking to? He's speaking to the church. Okay, so in 21 it says, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay, so now you are understanding Paul is trying to, he's telling you that there's something greater than the heart and there's the spirit of your mind. And so this is where the message is starting to sh gain shape because we cannot grieve the Holy Spirit that is supposed to renew us. We cannot grieve the Holy Spirit that is supposed to grant us life. We cannot grieve the Holy Spirit that is the very truth as to why Jesus Christ died. Okay, so as we have already deciphered who Paul is speaking to. In the same sense that we've already deciphered who God is speaking to. He's speaking to you. And that you could put away the former conversation of the old man. Which basically means that when you thought that you can't do it. And you can't become perfect. And you can't have this embodiment. And you can't become, you know, converted to the fullness of the truth. You can. Okay. So now that you have been converted to that. Don't think again about the former lust but come to the newness of Christ for it says here that you have been renewed in the spirit of your mind the same way that your mind could deceive you the mind could be weak or the mind could be strong and what I mean is that if your mind believes that you could become perfect then it's going to be working to become perfect and how it does that is that when sin wants to enter into your heart and wants to proceed in your mind and then it wants to come forth by your mouth the mind is going to stop it and it's going to say no you have purpose you have a reason to live Christ died for you that you could have this righteousness that he has prescribed on the fleshy tables of your heart the same way that a doctor prescribed medication he has prescribed you life and he has given it unto you more abundantly so you need to wake up Put away this foolish conversation and allow God to be manifested in every member of your body. Wow. So now your spirit has now renewed your mind that it can do all what God says that you could do. But it's not for the world to tell you that you are powerful. you got to believe it. If you believe it, then receive it. Prove it. It's amazing what you can do as long as you believe. There are things in your workplace, things in your life that you never thought you could do, but when tribulation came, it was either you get over it or it swallow you up. Well, what about sin? Are you going to let it control you the rest of your life? Are you going to become or overcome it? All I'm going to say is, if you're that powerful, if you have wisdom, knowledge, understanding, if you understand that you have not learned Christ the same way that maybe other people have learned Christ in saying that, hey, we're going to slip, we're going to fall, then prove it. For you didn't learn Christ the same way that these other people learned Christ. If you understand that Christ died for you, then prove it. Don't prove it by making mistakes and then calling upon Him. But put away the sins that so easily beset you and put on Christ that will keep on saving you. Again, you can do it. Just believe it and you can receive it. And prove it. Dealing with life. This is coming from Ephesians 4 verse 24 through 27. 
And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, I want you guys in your time, in your spare time, to just think about what do you consider righteousness? And then I want you to consider what do you consider true holiness? Now, true holiness. There's a lot of people professing godliness but denying the power. So that's not godliness because godliness comes with the power. So now Paul is telling you, he's trying to open up your eyes to the fact that there's people that may be taking the word of God and trying to profess holiness. But he wants you in your free time to define what true holiness is to you. Don't lie to yourself, okay? This is how you're going to deal with the things that are coming in your life. The, the drama, you know, the griefs, the people that just hate you, the people who despitefully use you, okay? In 25, it says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So, you may be looking at your enemy and saying, how am I going to forgive you? Well, think about it. When you were lying and stealing and hating and being angry without any reason, who are you hurting other than yourself? You're hurting God. You're hurting Christ because he died for you that you could have life and have it more abundantly. He died that you could go ahead and be perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. So now, there are people that are hurting you. In the same way that you may have once hurt Christ, crucifying him afresh, these people are doing the same thing to you. But you could forgive them. That they could have a hope. And have a lively hope. That they could see that the message that is written on your heart could also be written on their hearts. In the same way that you have, may have had the greatest of sins, Put it in a mental asylum because of all the things in which you have taken. You are pushed to the elements of hatred. And nobody wanted to forgive you, but God forgave you. And he gave you a lively hope the same way that they could have this lively hope. So just put away the lying. Understand that anyone could do it. The same sense that Christ did it, you could do it. And the same way that you could do it, they could do it. So don't look at them and say, well, you're nothing. But understand that something great is within them because they have the same creator. It says in 26, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Okay, so Paul understands that you're going to be angry. You cannot be fake. You're going to get angry, but don't sin. Ha. Huh. So this is what he's talking about here. So when you sin, you have an advocate. So when... You are given to sin. When you're given to anger, if you're not careful, if you don't extinguish it, just like a fire, it will burn. And whatsoever it burns, it doesn't care what it burns. It could burn your whole body. In the same sense, it could bring you to hell. So that's why he turns back. And it's kind of like an if-then statement. He says, you know, you cannot do one without the other. If you're angry and you're not supposed to sin... Don't be fooled. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, which basically means when the end of the day is and you're angry at your spouse or angry at, you know, your co-workers, don't let this anger rise up in you the next morning. Forgive them for your sake because you cannot sleep properly if you are angry and you have this kind of wrath because it's a fire. You know, just like it talks about um, the tongue is a member and it boasts itself of great things. It's a member of fire, a member of wrath, and it's not going to stop because it doesn't have rationale. So then he says, don't give place to the devil. The devil is seeking who he can devour. If you give place to sin, then the devil is soon going to come. And that's why you look at these people and you can't forgive some people in your life. And then soon enough, you can't forgive yourself. And then soon enough, you can't come to the fullness. 
So if you can't come to the fullness, then you're lukewarm. And if you're lukewarm, then God will spew you out. So this is how you're going to deal with life. Get over these things. Don't let people hinder you from the goodness. Stop lying to yourself. You can do it. And just deal with it. Stop making excuses. Pick up the cross and come follow him. And know that God is with you and will help you through it all. Alright, so this is the mystery. It says in Ephesians 4, verse 29 and 32, it says, Let no corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Okay, Paul, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a minister of the word. But, he turns around and says, as soon as you have given your life unto Christ, you're already a living example. You cannot deny your calling and your election sure. And greater, you cannot grieve the Holy Spirit any longer. You have to wake up. You have to grow up. It says in 30, it says, grieve not and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Wait a second. I'm sealed? So, you're saying that I can lose my calling and that I can lose my crown. Because if I grieve the very thing that's given me life, then I'm giving leeway into the devil in that, in the same sense, the devil could come into my life. And if the devil comes into my life, he's not going to come into the same way that he came a few years ago when I didn't know God. He's going to come back with a legion of devils. Which means I'm going to be turned into a reprobate. I'm going to say a lie is the truth and the truth's a lie. So if that's the truth, then I can no way take the graph word of God and minister to those who are lost. When I'm a reprobate, because I'm going to say that everything is a lie. Almost like when you say that you cannot be perfect, when clearly God has said, even Christ has professed it in Matthew 5 and in the end, be perfect even as your Heavenly Father is perfect. It says, corrupt conversation or evil conversation corrupt good manners. Which is why we get to the next point in 31. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You see why God forgave you? He forgave you. Because of his son. Because his son is now made in the similitude as us. As man, as flesh. But he also understands he was given unto the same things that we're given to. But he didn't grieve the Holy Spirit in the same way that some of us are grieving it. This is something that we have to teach. We have to know. If we do not make our calling and make our election sure through working upon ourselves every single day and not falling in the same snares of yesterday, we cannot have more grace granted unto us, which means that we cannot be given the advocate or this comforter that's going to save us. And if we're not saved, then we cannot be sealed unto the day of redemption. Which means that we are lost, yet we are living. So don't be dead in your sins. Have life and have it more abundantly. And how you're going to do that is by destroying the things of the mind. Start by believing that you could do better. And soon enough, you'll realize that the Word of God will continue to clean you up, even to a point 
where you can forgive yourself, forgive the people who hate you and despitefully use you, and come to the fullness of God. This is Pastor Sean Hackett coming from Resurrected Apostolic Faith Ministry. I hope this message reaches you in a good time and a good season. In all things, we give you thanks and giving praise to God, our Father. God bless.